I'd like to introduce Mark Cocte. He works at uh, John Hopkins University. He's working on the messenger uh, mission, which is the uh, probe that's being sent to Mercury. And uh, they're actually doing final orbital insertion in a couple of weeks, I believe, right? Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and let it take over. We were a little short on time with the last speaker, but uh, go ahead, Mark. Okay. Great. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. How are you guys all doing today? This is a, a pretty packed uh, a presentation I have for you. Uh, and I have to apologize. I'm still getting over some cold or something that killed me last week. So I'm going to be sniffling and coughing. But I'll try to do the best I can. Um, so what I'd like to do for you guys is basically just give you a history of the, uh, the uh, exploration of Mercury uh, from when, you know, man first recognized it as being a planet to when we sent the Mariner spacecraft there. And then in much more detail, uh, the messenger mission, which is what I work on. And the three flybys that we've done, the, the, what we found from those flybys, and give you a brief glimpse of what's to come. Now, uh, real quick overview, my job on the project is I'm a payload specialist. I work with uh, specifically one of the instrument teams. There's eight instruments on board the spacecraft. I work with one of the instrument teams, the spectrometer, the, mass, uh, the atmospheric and surface composition spectrometer. They want to do uh, certain observations. They tell me basically what they want to do. Then I have to take their wants, because they're scientists, and not engineers, and turn it into what the engineering team on the flight ops side would understand. So I have to kind of play middleman between the two sides. So this is the, uh, the messenger mission. Uh, it's headed up by Sean Solomon at the Carnegie Institute. He's the one who came up with the idea and then proposed to NASA. And NASA said, OK, it's, it's funded. It's yours. Go for it. It is a NASA discovery mission. It's run out of the uh, John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab in, uh, uh, in uh, Maryland. So Mercury. Mercury's been known for uh, a, a few years now. They discovered it you know, way back when they first started seeing things moving around the sky. The different uh, peoples had different names for Mercury. And they all pretty much uh, consider Mercury to be like a messenger, a little speedy guy, because he'd just pop up and down, pop up and down. And uh, as a little aside, you'll get a chance here in a couple weeks to actually see Mercury pop up and down uh, mid-March. Uh, it'll be around the 18th, 19th, 20th, or something like that, maybe a little later. It'll be pretty close to Ju where Jupiter will be. And it'll be almost as bright. Uh, Mercury's also been uh, featured in a lot of uh, like science fiction and fantasy readings, as well as uh, some uh, science fiction television shows like Star Trek and Futurama. But now more into the science side of everything. Uh, Mercury is a, a fairly lonely planet of all the planets out there. And we're, we're going to not discuss the whole Pluto debate in this discussion. <laughs> the moon has had 48 missions to it. Uh, Venus has had 29. Earth has had countless. Mars has had about 29. There's been now over 10 missions to comet. This should be up by one or two. Uh, there's been nine missions to asteroids. And Mercury's had one and three quarter missions to it. Yeah. Mariner had it, it's completed its, its three flybys. That was its full mission. And Messenger's only done three flybys. It's not completed its mission. But why, why would we want to go to Mercury? There's a number of reasons. One, we hope to understand better how the planets came to be by studying how, what the composition of Mercury is and why it is. Uh, it, Mercury is a planet of extremes. And I'm going to cover this in a, little, uh, a few minutes here. And compared to most of the other planets in the solar system, uh, up until 2008, we knew, we knew more about Pluto than we did about Mercury, almost. And up until 2008, we'd only seen uh, less than half of the surface of Mercury. That was from the Mariner flybys. Um, I mentioned the planet of extremes. First of all, it has the most eccentric orbit of all the planets. Again, we're discounting Pluto in regards to the planets here. Uh, it has the most inclined orbit of all the planets. It's the smallest of all the planets. And it has uh, also the highest temperature extremes from the pre-dawn hours to the early afternoon hours. It's over 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit cha uh, temperature change. It has the shortest sidereal period of just under 88 days. And is the only planet in our solar system that has a 3-2 spin resonance for its day rotation and its revolution around the sun. 
And it has the highest uncompressed, gravitationally uncompressed density of all the rocky bodies. And it has a dipole magnetic field, which we had totally not expected until the Mariner spacecraft went by. And it has the smallest axial tilt of all the planets, at 0 0.01 degrees. Earth is 23 and a half degrees, so you know we have all these great seasons. Mars, or, I'm sorry, Mercury, there, there's craters at the poles where the, the phrase the sun don't shine literally has meaning. And we're hoping that we'll be finding some ices up there from, from many, many uh, millions and billions of years ago. And it's a uh, comparison size, uh, size comparison of Earth and Mercury. This is a Mariner image of uh, Mercury, by the way. All the Mariner images you see of Mercury will have a little gash in down the one side of it. That's an area that the Mariner spacecraft just never saw from its three flybys. But Mariner 10. Mariner 10 had was, was the first spacecraft to visit Mercury. That was back in the mid-70s, 74, 75. And it performed three flybys. Due to the orientation of its orbit around the sun and its encounters with Mercury and Mercury's orbit around the sun, every flyby was on the same side of the planet. And every flyby, there was a little bit less of Mariner 10 working. So they saw less and less as, as time went on. But in any event, they saw a lot just from those flybys. And they had a number of accomplishments. Uh, again, first spacecraft to visit um, Mercury. It was the first one to use gravity assist. When, we, uh, when they sent Mariner in, they flew past Venus to bend its uh, orbital trajectory in. So it got into Mercury's orbit easier. It's the first to use solar sailing, but it was not designed to use solar sailing. It was the first uh, spacecraft to turn around and look at Earth after it had left from beyond the moon's orbit. It was the first to have multiple flybys of the same target. That would be Mercury 3. And it's the first to use celestial navigation. And it's the first to uh, image the Venusian atmosphere since it used Venus as a, um, a, uh, a trajectory correction uh, point. Now, discoveries that Mariner had made. Now, remember, when, before Mariner went up there, astronomers saw a rocky body near the sun that's baking. It's warm. They don't know much more about it. But it's, it's got to be, it's very small, and it can't have a magnetic field because it's dead. But then Mariner flew by and discovered there's a magnetic field on this thing. And it seems to be global. They, they discovered it was much, much denser uh, than was predicted from the uh, telemetry uh, uh, returns that they got from the Mariner spacecraft. And that the, they, they discovered there was a, a thin, rarefied atmosphere, or what we would call an exosphere. There's, there's a gas cloud, if you will, around Mercury, but it's so thin, it basically blends with space. So we call that an exosphere. And uh, they were able to do a temperature measurements of the planet. So this is a, uh, uh, the graph from the uh, Mariner data from when they flew by of the magnetometer. <laughs> they had thought that the planet is so small, it should have cooled down, there should not be a liquid core. But there's this, this global, what appears to be a global magnetic field, which is indicative of having a liquid core, which seems contradictory to the planet. So the thoughts were, well, maybe the, the, the magnetic field is locked to the crust, like uh, on, on Mars. Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field, but it does have magnetic field areas that are locked to its crust. But they, they've uh, mostly discounted that from the Mariner data. We, we're revisiting this again with the uh, messenger data. This is just a graph showing you the, um, the, uncompressed, uh, the, the compressed densities. You can see Mercury is right here, and Earth is just a little more dense than Mercury. That's just also uh, radius, uh, density by radius. And this is one um, theory on how Mercury possibly formed in the early solar system. It was this body right here, and something else came along and smashed into it, stripping off the outer lighter elements from the planet, leaving the denser, darker material behind, which is why we have a, a smaller, very dense, rocky body. This is a radar returns from the uh, pole, the North Pole specifically. And there's some very bright areas around the North Pole, which we believe are ices. Um, 
that um, we've never imaged. And as uh, this moment, uh, even Messenger has not looked at these things. When we go into orbit, we'll be going into a polar orbit, which I'll show you in a little bit. And we'll be able to fly over the poles. Won't be able to image them because they'll still be in shadow. Um, but we'll be able to take other measurements from the poles and, and ascertain what's down there. These are uh, the radar measurements. You got the, uh, the ice up here in the North Pole, and this, uh, got this giant crater down here. You got this giant crater here. This is from the side of Mercury that was not imaged by Mariner 10. Now I want you to remember that this giant North crater here and the giant South crater here, I'm gonna show those to you from uh, messenger images later. This is a uh, image from Mariner 10 of the Caloris Basin. The Caloris Basin is the fourth largest uh, impact basin in our solar system. And this is the only thing that Mariner 10 ever saw of it. The rest of it was hidden behind, uh, on the other side of the planet from the sun in shadow, could not be seen. But uh, the scientists estimated that this thing's about uh, 800 miles across. It's, it's fairly large. And this is just uh, looking very uh, along the Terminator here. Uh, that's some of the, the detail that's in the Caloris Basin. You see all these uh, uplift areas. You can see these trenched out areas. And you see a number of uh, uh, subsequent impacts from uh, impactors that came after the Caloris Basin was uh, uh, formed. Uh, I also wanted to let you guys know there's going to be a test during this lecture. Uh, you, you laugh. Okay, uh, Messenger, I wanna bring you guys up to current, current time now. Messenger is the Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging spacecraft. We launched in 2004, August 3rd, 2004, and the point of Messenger was to answer these six questions. Why is Mercury so dense? What are, what's the deal with the magnetic field? Is it truly global and how is it formed? What are the volatiles that are uh, important at Mercury? What's the geologic history of Mercury? What are the unusual bright areas up at the poles? And what's the structure of the core of Mercury? In which a lot of these tie into each other. As we start answering one question, we'll start to answer some others. So our objectives for this mission are, uh, the primary objectives are here. We wish to image the entire surface of Mercury in full color. And I'm gonna show you some beautiful full color, real color, photographs uh, shortly. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a detailed survey of the magnetic field. We're going to be, as I mentioned, looking for those ice deposits up at the, the poles, or we're going to be trying to see what's coming off of the surface in the exosphere using spectroscopy. We're going to be mapping uh, the surface composition of the, the minerals and elements as, as much detail as we possibly can. We're going to be doing a surface topography measurement of most of the planets, since we'll have a laser altimeter on board. Uh, we're going to be looking for any irregularities in Mercury's rotation that will tell us some indication of what's going on inside the core. And we're going to be doing a complete mapping of the exosphere. We've already started many of these things, but nothing is accomplished uh, from the first three flybys. So our challenges. We have a number of challenges. First. It's very warm at Mercury. Sunblock 2 million won't work. <laughs> so we have to design at the Applied Physics Lab a special ceramic sunshade to protect the instrumentation on board the spacecraft. And I'll show you that in a few moments. Getting to orbit is actually very, very difficult. It's more difficult getting to Mercury orbit than it is to send a, a probe to Pluto. Um, so it, in order to do this, 55% of the mass of the spacecraft was fuel at when we launched. And we'll be using the bulk of that to get ourselves to Mercury's orbit. Also, once we're in orbit, we're going to be in a highly elliptical orbit going around Mercury every 12 hours. And it's gonna go from 125 miles just over the North Pole to uh, 15,000 kilometers over the South Pole. A very elliptical orbit. And we'll be doing this twice a day, twice an Earth day. Why such an it's just the, uh, the question was why such an elliptical orbit, it's just the, 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 um, the way the nav team could get us to the planet as quickly as possible with the constraints that we were given for the fuel and mass. 
There is going to be a follow-on mission to us, which I'm going to briefly discuss, called Bepi Colombo. And they're going to try and go a little bit slower, learning what we are learning now, taking our lessons learned. And they're going to try and go into a more uh, circular orbit. Right? Uh, uh, as I mentioned, getting to, uh, to Mercury orbit is extremely difficult. The, the, the main reason is you're going down the gravitational well of the sun. The closer you get to the sun, the more energy you're picking up and the more energy you have to expend to slow down. If you're going out, as the further you get from the sun, the further out the gravitational well you get, the less energy you need to push yourself further out. So if we were to go straight to Mercury's orbit from Earth, we would pick up so much speed right here, we would not be able to carry enough fuel to slow down. We just shoot right, right past it. We tried doing a, a loop in, Again, we still wouldn't be able to carry enough fuel to slow down. So what we will ultimately do is spiral in a number of times and then get into Mercury's orbit. This is the orientation of the orbit once we'll be uh, there in just a couple weeks. We'll be going into orbit the evening of March 17th, about 8.43 p.m., I believe. And the uh, orbital inclination now is uh, pretty guaranteed to be about 82 degrees tilted from uh, the norm. The uh, orbit is also inertially fixed over the planet. We won't precess around the planet like satellites do on Earth. We'll be set into a fixed plane. And as Mercury goes around the sun, it will rotate below us. So we will use Mercury's rotation below us to be able to view all aspects of the surface. This is just a, a graphic demonstrate, uh, representation of uh, the uh, spacecraft. Back here is the, uh, the payload area, and then this is the, uh, the, the sun shield here, then the uh, solar arrays. On the side over there is the uh, suite of instruments that are on board. On the upper left, you can see the nozzle right here. That's the main uh, engine for the spacecraft, and the fuel cells are on here. This area right here is this spot right over here. That's where all the instrumentation is, and that's all where it's pointing. One of the large challenges we will have once we're in orbit is pointing the instruments. Except for the MDIS camera, all the instruments are fixed down the bore site, which means they're just pointing in one direction, all of them in the same direction. The MDIS camera has a, a pivot arm that will allow it to move in two degrees along one plane, uh, up to 40 degrees in one direction, 50 degrees in the other direction. But that's it. If we want to look at something, say there's a feature right here on, on the wall, and the, the spacecraft is pointing here. We have to move the entire spacecraft up this way in order to view that, in, that feature or take any data from that feature. If one instrument wants to look at that feature, but one instrument wants to look at a feature down here, another instrument wants to look at a feature over there, there's a problem. So what we have to do, and this is what we've been doing for uh, the past couple years, is working out procedures on how to determine who's going to have priority at what point in the orbit, at what time of the year, to control the guidance and uh, to have the guidance and control of the spacecraft to point the spacecraft where that instrument needs to point. Everyone else is basically going to be what we call ride along. So when the instrument wants to look there, everyone's going to look there and just going to have to take observations of opportunity. Once they're done with their observation up there, this instrument may get the opportunity to take over and then point the spacecraft down here and take their data, everyone else will just follow along. So, and we'll, we'll be doing this in orbit constantly in three weeks uh, ahead of time. We'll be building what we call um, command loads, which are a, a week-long sequence of events that will be detailed down to the fraction of a second, three weeks ahead of time, uh, putting those together, testing them, then uploading them to spacecraft just a, a couple days before they're to execute. And we'll be doing this for a full year. And we hope if we get an extension for a, a year following after that. So we're going to be a very busy uh, group of people for the next uh, year or two. Uh, this is the solar uh, panels. The solar arrays on Messenger are actually two-thirds mirrors. That's because we're going to be so close to the sun that we're going to be getting a lot more solar radiation than you would here on Earth. We don't want the solar uh, cells to melt, so we're using the mirrors to reflect most of the energy back off of the solar cells. 
the solar panels also, instead of being full onto the sun, we can camp them up to 72 degrees. So they aren't getting full bore sun radiation all the time. And we can adjust that as the, the uh, situation dictates. There will be times in our orbit when we will go into eclipse behind Mercury and we will have no solar power. We'll have to rely on the batteries. At that point, we don't want to rely on the batteries to do full uh, science observations. We're just going to keep the spacecraft healthy and alive. So it's power down all this, the science instruments, make sure all the uh, basic spacecraft functionality um, runs off the batteries. When we come back out of um, the uh, eclipse, which can be upwards of an, over an hour, then we use the solar panels to recharge the batteries, and then we can power everything back up and recommence uh, solar, uh, recommence observations once again. So this is the size of the spacecraft right here relative to how big humans are. This is in the, uh, the NASA clean room where they're putting it together. And they're putting it onto a, uh, a table here which they're going to violently shake the thing, which is to simulate a launch and make sure that nothing falls off. This is the, uh, the ceramic sun shield that I uh, mentioned earlier. The thing is only a few millimeters thick. And uh, it, as you may remember from the uh, illustrations earlier, it does not surround the entire spacecraft. It only covers one front part of the spacecraft. So we always have to keep the spacecraft, the, the sun between the, the main body of the spacecraft and the solar shield. The solar shield on the front side will be upwards of over 600 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on average. On the back side, it's going to be about room temperature. And it's to be this way the entire mission. This, um, the fact that we have the, 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 the sun shield only covering part of the spacecraft means our ability to rotate the spacecraft up, down, sideways is very, very limited because we can't let the sun the radiation from the sun impact the instrumentation in the back part of the spacecraft. Once we do that, things start frying because they're not meant for that environment, that, that high heat environment. Uh, this is just a, a timeline showing you when we have, uh, when we were launched, our first flyby was Earth a year after we launched. We used a gravitation, the gravity well of Earth to bend the, the orbit of, uh, the, the trajectory orbit of Messenger to a tighter, um, spiral to get it to rendezvous with Venus in 2006 and then again in 2007. We used the first rendezvous with Venus to slow us down a little bit. We used the second one to slow us down and bend the uh, trajectory in a little tighter. And then we had three visits to Mercury in 2008, um, to the, this there, and then one in 2009. What we have for, uh, what you see DSMs here, are we have deep space maneuvers. We had five deep space maneuvers scheduled for the, uh, for the uh, duration of the uh, cruise phase. Everything up from launch to we go into MOI, Mercury Orbital Insertion, it's called the cruise phase. The deep space uh, maneuvers are when we fire the main engine for about five to ten minutes, again, slowing the spacecraft down some more and trying to get it into a tighter orbit to get it to line up with Mercury uh, closer and closer. The closer we can get it to line up with Mercury's um, velocity as it's going around the sun, the less fuel we need to use when we go into orbit. And this is a, uh, a graph. Down the bottom is the timeline again here. And then the different uh, from Earth, rendezvous, Venus, Venus, Mercury, 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 each one of these lines represents those, uh, those uh, cruise phases. It's better seen in uh, color here. These are the number of orbits that we have achieved. We've gone through 15 orbits around the sun so far since 2004. And uh, just to break this down a little bit, uh, since December of this year, this is where Earth, Venus, Mercury, and Messenger were relative to each other back on December 3rd. And this is January 3rd, one month later. This is February 3rd, one month ago. And this is today, just a, a, a few hours ago. And we'll be rendezvousing right about there in two weeks. So that's the preliminary of what's to come and some of the uh, logistics and the challenges we've, we have to overcome and we are still faced with. 
What I'd like to do now is go through some of the flybys that we've done of Mercury. Um, the first flyby of Mercury was going to bring us around the backside. This, this is uh, Mercury right here. The pale, undefined uh, area is the section of Mercury that was not seen by Mariner 10. So as we come in down here, we'll see this back part of Mercury right here that we'd never seen before. So our first flyby was already going to give us data that we hadn't gotten before. So it was not just going to be a uh, engineering uh, success in getting our, our successful flyby for the NAV team and for the engineers to, to slow the spacecraft down. It was also going to uh, generate some science findings also. This is a high level detailed view of the happenings on a given flyby. This is uh, in about 12 hours before, 12 hours after the um, encounter. I'm breaking it down here. These, are, these ticks are in um, increments of, the large ticks are in increments of days. Um, wait. Yeah, yeah these, these hours, hours, these little ticks here are increments of five minutes. And then this is increments of just, uh, this is increments of five minutes right here. This is the, uh, one of the flybys. And this is a very high level uh, overview of what goes on with the spacecraft. For the flybys, we uploaded over 57,000 lines of code to do one flyby. When we're in orbit, we'll be doing this twice a day, daily. We do it at work. <laughs> That's what the command load is. We, we put these things together, we put the command load together, and then we upload it to the spacecraft. Um, that's what the flight ops, that's the pro job of the flight ops team, is to make sure it gets up to the spacecraft properly, and then their job is to make sure the science gets sent back down, and the, and the engineering telemetry also gets sent back down properly so we can analyze it. This is uh, one of the first, uh, this is the very first image we took of Mercury uh, during the first flyby. Uh, we had uh, used the MDIS camera for the navigation team to verify. We took two images a day as we were approaching for the first uh, flyby to, to ensure that we were on target, that we weren't going to be off any. And if we get closer, you can see the crescent becomes more and more defined. You can start seeing detail in the lit area of Mercury. You can start seeing this cratered region here. This is the last uh, op -nav, optical navigation uh, image that we took. And this part of Mercury had been seen by Mariner 10. So what we would get now is a comparison for what Mariner 10 saw versus what Messenger saw. We could put the two together and, and see the differences in what the two were seeing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Well, actually, I'll talk about that right now. Uh, so this crater right here is this crater right here. This image here is a Mariner 10 image. And this one is the Messenger image. It's right along the Terminator. When Mariner 10 imaged it, it was more face on in the sun. So we're looking at the difference of phase angle here. It's like the same as if you look at the moon during a, a crescent phase, you'll see a lot of shadows up until it's about a quarter full versus looking at the exact same area during a full moon. During the uh, crescent phase up to the, full, to the first quarter, you see shadow, you see definition, you see relief. Once a full moon, you see a flat light area, but you see different things. And this is what um, this is showing here. So our results from the first flyby was we um, were very close to nailing what our aim point was on the spacecraft uh, uh, for, for flying past uh, Mercury. We were off by two tenths of a second, which is almost unheard of in, in uh, planetary exploration circles. Uh, we our, our aim point was exceptionally accurate. It's, at this point, was the most accurate flyby in, uh, in planetary exploration circles. We were able to uh, reduce the uh, velocity of messenger by a few kilometers a second. We were able to start imaging the surface at about 150 meters per pixel, whereas uh, most of the Mariner 10 stuff was, on average, about two kilometers per pixel we were able to see about 30% of the surface we had never seen before during this flyby. And it just in the one, this one flyby alone, we more than doubled all the information we knew about.